today. I was really weak. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hey. Hey. Um, so my name is Chris Brooks, and I'm with Chattanooga Organized for Action. And I think it's really important to begin by explaining my story of why I'm personally involved in this organization, what this organization is. Um, so I, I really hate public speaking. I know I seem probably very subdued right now, but I'm actually a wreck, and it's very uncomfortable to be up here. Um, and that's because I have a disease called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. I'm sure most of you are pretty aware of what that, that is. Um, and so my, uh, physiologically, like, it, it's very painful for me to speak in front of people. I feel very stressed. Um, so I have to take very big notes and make sure that everything's right in front of me. Um, and I have PTSD because I'm a survivor of domestic abuse. Um, I grew up in a very violent household. Uh, if you think, like, about any caricature of, you know, uh, adolescent uh, behavior on, on TV. You know, the kids like run into the room and slamming the door and screaming, I hate you. That, that never would have happened in my house. I would have been thrown through the door. Um, it, it, it's really a strange thing. Um, for me, domestic abuse was never something I identified with, even though it was something that was so readily like a, a daily part of my reality, seeing my mom beaten, seeing my little brother beaten, being beaten. Um, but it's nothing I ever identified with. It was something that happened in Lifetime movies. It was something uh, that was apart for me. And when I went to UTK, I was lucky enough to go through therapy up there and to start actually thinking about that and start actually identifying with it. And it was a really painful process. Um, but over, the, over the coming to terms with all that, I, I started to have some realizations that there were rules guarding the way I was raised that I was never made aware of. The first rule was that we never talked about it. So I'd wake up in the morning and go upstairs and maybe all of my belongings are in the road and maybe I can't eat my cereal because my jaw hurts too bad, but we wouldn't talk about it. And if I did talk about it, the problem wasn't with the conditions that I was being raised in, the problem was with me, right? And that's how you enable a situation like that. And after I moved back from UTK and I started getting a job down here and working at a uh, a literal blood-sucking corporation, CSL Plasma. Has anybody here ever donated plasma? Not a great, not a great experience. But so I, I've been a donor, but I also worked there for a while, and the conditions were really bad. And when I tried to speak up about them and form a union, I was fired summarily, illegally. And I realized that the same rules that were guarding my behavior were the same rules that guard our behavior all the time in our, in our daily lives. You don't talk about it, and if you talk about it, if you talk about what you see that's wrong. There's not, it's not that there's something wrong with the situation, there's something wrong with you for trying to identify it and trying to change it. And I feel like that's kind of like the, one of the principles of Chattanooga Organized for Action is, as an organization is that we share the same values, the same concerns. We want equality, we want fairness, we want freedom, we want liberty. We want people to be able to have enough to, to be able to get by. We want people to be able to determine their own conditions. right? And we're not going to let other people tell us that that's wrong. And so we speak up about things that we see. And that's, that's what led us into the recall. Now, it, we did a great job talking about a media frame for this because there, I, I could talk about media frames all day with this stuff. There, there was another great example with Iraq with Saddam Hussein's statues being pulled down. Because that's like a literal picture that the media was shown everywhere and it made it look like Tahir Square, like a, like a mass revolt. But then if you look at what Europe was showing, it was military troops who brought in people to that square and asked them to pull the, the statue down. It was totally staged. Right? But it was an easy narrative. There was already a narrative being generated out, and so all they did was pass the picture along, and the press is lazy, largely. They don't ask questions, they're not critical, and so they just repeat it. And that's gonna be a common theme that I'm gonna to come to, which is that the purpose, of the purpose of the bourgeois press, the purpose of the corporate press, is not to create concerned, engaged citizens, people who are committed to being responsible for the conditions of their own lives. Their purpose is to sell newspapers and to sell advertisements to put as many advertisements in front of as many faces of as many consumers as possible. And this has created a broken system, a broken media. And what that looks like here is that the recall was created to, to fit a national narrative with the Tea Party. And the Tea Party was, was very peripheral to it. I mean, they were involved with it, but we got two-thirds of the signatures, right? And yet we were never given the time to actually talk about why we were doing this, right? For us, the recall was a referendum on business as usual. Because what you're seeing across the nation and across the globe is global discontent with the way the system is, right? You see the Tea Party and Occupy. And they both are saying kind of similar things in some ways. What they're saying is that the system is broken because the system doesn't represent us. Representative democracy is fundamentally flawed, right? 
James Madison was right. He was dead on about what he wanted. He wanted to make sure that he could concentrate power, concentrate the decision-making practices into a small circle of people. And he didn't want any of you who aren't property, who don't own other people, like literally own other people, to be involved in that process. You don't get to have a say about your land. You don't get to have a say about your lives or about your futures. And that's what he was scared of. And that for us is why we were, like, why we were driving the recall was because we recognize that the system of government that we have is largely created to exclude us. And we were wanting to change that. But we're not the first ones to want to change that. Recall was created in the early 20th century during the progressive era. It was recall, referendum, and initiative. Three different forms of direct democracy. Which if any of you have seen like the videos of Occupy Wall Street, they actually use forms of direct democracy in their basic decision making practices. What that means is you try to make it as non-hierarchical as possible. You don't concentrate decision-making decisions and into, or practices into just one or a few small people. You, you, you create a level playing field where as many people as possible can directly engage in that process. right? And so that's what direct democracy does. Recall allows us to, to remove people from power, it, but not even that necessarily, because what, what we didn't remove the mayor from power. He's obviously still in it, right? But what we did is we gave the voters a choice. We said, you know what, we don't think this guy's doing a great job. We don't think that his, his values reflect ours. We don't think he's making the right decisions for our community. And we want to drag him down here to where we are and say, what do you all think? Do you guys agree with us? Because if you do, you deserve to have the choice to make that decision and hold these people accountable. A referendum says that if they pass a law, we can change it. We can put it to a ballot. So if they say that they're going to they're shut through a law stating that you don't have the right to clean the air, well, we can put it on a ballot and put it to a vote, because I bet the majority of us say that we deserve to have clean air. And an initiative is citizen-led legislation. Now, neither a referendum nor an initiative has ever been done in the history of our city. A recall was done for the very first time with us. But during the entire process of doing the recall, the media never provided a historical context of what we were trying to do, what we were trying to say, and what we were trying to point to. Right? Instead, they just went to this easy, predetermined narrative about Tea Party discontent over taxes. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, it was over taxes. But it wasn't because I'm against taxes. I'm all for taxes, if they're going to the right things. Right? The problem is, is that we were raising taxes while at the same time we're cutting social services for the poor. While we're cutting social services for marginalized communities, for the disabled, for, for neglected and abused children, for women. And I can't justify that. And I don't think the mayor can justify that. And I think that if the voters were to decide on it, they wouldn't think it was justifiable. So that was never actually given uh, as a reason. We, why were we motivated to go out every day and knock on doors? But not only that, why were people in the communities in the, 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 that we were knocking in, why were they grabbing the petitions and running with them and getting their neighbors assigned? And I think it's because they see the same thing we do, which is that the system has excluded them, and they're angry about this, but they don't have an outlet for it. right? And that, I guess it gets down to the definition of democracy in a large way. I would say that a society is democratic insofar as people are capable of engaging in the process of making decisions that directly affect them. So if I make a decision that directly affects you, you deserve to be able to participate within that, right? To, to help shape my and form the decision that's being made. And I think that we're about as dem to call America a democracy is like calling the Soviet Union a democracy. It, it, it's a lie. It's absolutely like what we get every four years in this city is a choice between the River City mayor or the Signal Mountain mayor or the Lookout Mountain mayor. It's just different sectors of society that own this city and have for decades, right, that, that, are, that are fighting with each other. And that's our choice. And that's something that needs to change, right? But it can only change if we start becoming more democratic. If we start working with each other to collectively start saying that we're going to hold these people accountable and we're not going to let them continue to do business as usual. So what are things that our taxes have been used for? They're being used to police communities. They're being used to destroy public housing, to put in low density mixed income housing, which is pushing more and more poor folks out of the city, further out where they don't have access to public transportation or jobs or grocery stores. It's not going to provide health care for, for low-income folks. You know, we paid $500 million to bring Volkswagen here, and the buses, the public transportation system, doesn't even run out to Enterprise South. So let me, let me, So if I were to describe it to you, what we've done is we've said we're going to cut social services for the poor, 
in order to give money to Volkswagen, a highly profitable, multi-billion dollar, multinational corporation, so a middle class people can go and have job interviews with them. So what we've effectively done is we've stolen from the poor to bribe the rich to give jobs to the middle class. And that is a losing, losing strategy. But none of this has ever been reported on. None of our views are ever, are ever put in the frame. In fact, the editorial board at the Chattanooga Times Street Press has consistently refused to meet with us. I've sent probably a dozen emails to Harry Austin, and he's never replied to a single one. So he's sitting there all day, paternalistically, telling the voters and the citizens of Chattanooga that they should not support the recall, and they should not support this effort, while he won't even talk to the people who are engaging in it. He won't even give us room to describe why we're doing it. Instead, he just go ahead and, and cherry picks this Tea Party narrative and just throws everything into it. So, it, it, oh, and here's another great story. So, the, the mayor at one point in time, uh, there, there was a journalist, we, we have occasionally had real investigative journalists come to town from New York and places like that where I guess they do that kind of thing. And, uh, and one of them was here and he was digging stuff up on the mayor and he didn't like it so he banned him from City Hall, which isn't even legal, not even possible. His name's Mike Weber, you can look this up, it's a true story. Mike what? Mike Weber. What? It, it, it's wild. With the stuff this mayor has done, he, he's, he, 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 and, and that's the attitude. That, that you see in most of the politicians we have is that they feel so entitled to their position and they get so angry when us rabble, when us, when us the people decide that we want to be able to make the decisions for ourselves and take that responsibility for ourselves. Um, I, I think another point is that, the, is that the newspaper, like yeah, the journalists are lazy, they're working on deadlines, they don't want to dig too deep. Um, it, they don't want to lose access, like Mike Weber did, when the mayor basically said, we're not going to give you any more information, we're going to give it all to the Chattanooga, and we're going to give it all to the Nuga, and we have very few newspapers here, we have very few media sources, right? So they can, they can concentrate that uh, a little bit more. And then they always go with the sensational side of it. They don't ever try to go for nuance, they don't ever try to go for complexity, and they definitely don't provide a historical context. They definitely don't look at this thing as a broad, as a broad issue. So if you're, if you're out there in the public, and you're just reading the newspaper, you see Paul Page. Is, is, you guys, anybody here know who Paul Page is? Great, one bless my son. Okay, so Paul, the, Paul Page was a friend of the mayor and uh, helped him get elected. He's, he's been fired from four other cities, from four other municipal governments. All right, one of those is for sexual harassment. Well, the mayor knows he can't get this guy hired in the city, so he does something that no other mayor's ever tried to do. He creates a new division that's like a department but doesn't have overview by the city council. So what he basically does is says, I'm going to create by fiat a new branch of the government. I'm going to install my friend to be the head of it. I'm going to give him a salary that's very lucrative. And then he only reports to me and there's no oversight of him. And this guy's a sexual predator. And he starts sexually harassing city employees. And the city employees start speaking up about it. But, and, the, and the mayor, the mayor's administration denies the allegations and then retaliates against the employees. And all of this comes out in, in an EEOC report, an Equal Employment Opportunity Commission report. And then there's some backlash. So the public's like, what the hell? You know, like this dude's hired, he's put into this position, he's paid a lucrative salary, he's been fired from four other cities, and he's sexually harassing our own city employees. And when they speak about it, the city comes after them for having the, you know, the guts to speak up. Right? And, and you better think that that does set a precedent, it does send a message. To anybody else who might want to you know, stand up and speak out about anything else that's happening to them in the city. Right? And then the mayor turns around and Paul Page says, well, I'm going to resign. He's not fired. Even though there's currently a Department of Justice uh, investigation of him and the mayor right now for this. He doesn't, he's not fired. He gets to resign. He gets to keep his pension. He gets to keep his health care benefits. And the mayor actually goes on the record with the press and says, well, you know, I can understand why he did that. Who would want to be in the shooting gallery? So the mayor doesn't identify with the victims, he identifies with the predator. 